Well, hello and welcome to the Hammond Isles Financial Power Hour. My name is Greg Hammond, the CEO of Hammond Isles Wealth Advisors. Uh, We're a firm that has offices in Connecticut, Vermont, and Virginia, and work with clients in 31 states around the United States. Uh, So wherever you are, we can assist you in being a financial coach on guiding you to living a life with purpose and having a better understanding around your investments and what you're invested in and why. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about inherited IRAs. What do you do? Whether you're an individual who has recently inherited an IRA, or if you are planning ahead that eventually all of us will pass our IRAs on, and it's important for us to think about that Uh, Even though we'll be gone, we want to make sure that we transition our wealth to our next generation, our beneficiaries, uh, in a way that is tax efficient um, so that more of our wealth passes on rather than being lost to income taxes. And over the last several years, there has been some significant changes around the transition of wealth from uh, owner of an IRA to the beneficiaries. It started in 2019 with the passing of the SECURE Act, and that basically eliminated the ability to stretch an IRA. Uh, Prior to the SECURE Act in 2019, anyone who inherited an IRA who was a a non-spouse beneficiary could basically transfer their share of the IRA that they inherited over into an inherited IRA that they own and then could stretch out the distributions out of that IRA over their life based on a life expectancy table created by the IRS. However, that has been eliminated. No longer can non-spouse beneficiaries uh, stretch out an IRA. There is now a 10-year rule that we'll talk about today. And then the SECURE Act added some additional uh, changes that will be implemented as well. So today we're going to talk about inherited IRAs. What do you do or what do your beneficiaries have to do when they inherit it? Uh, Just as part of our disclosures, I want to point out a couple of things. One is that right now, the basis of this presentation and all of the rules around inherited IRA are just proposed regulations by the IRS. There have not been any finalized regulations yet, uh, and they're still being fine-tuned. And that's one of the challenges when Congress has this habit, as they did with both the SECURE Act and SECURE Act 2.0, passing them in December of a year does not give the IRS a lot of time to work out all the details and get everything ironed out. So although it's been uh, a year for the SECURE Act 2.0 or in four years for the SECURE Act, these details are still being worked out. So the presentation today is based on what is available to us at this time, and that may change. And that's why we always recommend that you always work with a tax advisor that can consult you on your personal situation based on the circumstances at that time. As always, questions are welcome. Uh, During our webinar, you can uh, submit your questions during the the webinar with the chat function, or or at the end, we will take questions as well. Uh, If you're watching this on YouTube in the video, you can always submit those questions either after our webinar or at at the end of your watching of our video through an email to hello at hiwealth.com. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover today. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk first about what you or your beneficiaries will need to do with an inherited IRA. Secondly, we're going to talk about some strategies that you can use when you inherit an IRA, being aware of the circumstances that are required. What are some things that you can do as a beneficiary when you inherit an IRA. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about some strategies that you can use in passing along your IRA to the next generation or your beneficiaries on how you can make sure that more wealth and less taxes uh, come from your IRA. So what do you need to know? 
Well, it all starts with an IRA owner and with an individual retirement arrangement is what IRA stands for in the tax code, which we refer to as an IRA, but it has to be owned by an individual. An IRA cannot be owned by a trust. It has to be in an individual name. And when we look at creating the account, you name a designated beneficiary and that you have designated beneficiaries and also what are called non-designated beneficiaries. So there will always be a beneficiary to your IRA. Whether you choose one or not, there is a default function uh, that basically your estate can become the default or in some states they may have other provisions or other custodians may have other provisions in their documents. But typically, a non-designated beneficiary consists of your estate. If you allow it to just go to your estate, which is then directed by your will or other legal documents, or according to the state uh, laws and regulations, if you don't have a will, you can also name charities as beneficiaries on an IRA. And there are some trusts that you can add that are considered non-designated beneficiaries. In these cases, in these non-designated beneficiaries will be required to liquidate the inherited IRA within five years. I have yet, though, to meet a charity that waited five years for the money. Usually they say, hey, We want the money now when they find out that they're a uh, beneficiary of an IRA, but they do have up to five years and it has to be fully paid out by that point in time. Now, the other side of things, what we call designated beneficiaries, fall into two categories, eligible designated beneficiaries or non-eligible designated beneficiaries. So basically, there are specific people that are kind of quantified in the tax code as eligible designated beneficiaries, and they have special rules around that. And then basically everybody else just falls into the non-eligible designated beneficiary. So let's take a look at who falls into the eligible designated beneficiaries. You basically have spouses, minor children, disabled individuals, those that are chronically ill, or individuals that are not more than 10 years younger than the IRA owner when they passed. So let's take a look at each of these. Now the spouse, the spouse has different things that they can do and they have four basic options when they inherit an IRA. The first is that they can actually become the owner. That if a husband and wife and the husband passes away, The husband's IRA can either be rolled over into the wife's IRA or she can become the owner of that IRA just straight on out. And this is one of the only times that that can happen as a beneficiary is through a spouse. Now, one of the things to be aware of is that this may not always be the best thing to do depending on the circumstances. And the reason I say this is it depends on the age of the spouse and that if you have an IRA, when you take distributions out of an IRA before age 59 and a half, you are subject to an early withdrawal penalty. So if you are a spouse and you're over age 59 and a half, there's no penalty for distribution. So you can just roll that over into your IRA or become the owner of the IRA. If you're under 59 and a half and you inherited an IRA, you may want to choose at transferring it to an inherited IRA. So rather than it becoming your own IRA, it becomes an inherited IRA from your spouse. And the reason for that is that inherited IRAs overall, whether that's for spouses, children, anyone who is a beneficiary of an inherited IRA, the distributions are not subject to an early withdrawal penalty. So if I'm 55 years old and I inherit my wife's IRA, I may choose to transfer into an inherited IRA because then for those four years between 55 and 59 and a half, 
I can tap into that IRA and take distributions without any early withdrawal penalty. Now, if I don't need those funds and I don't anticipate tapping into them until after age 59 and a half, then certainly it can be simplified by just becoming the owner or rolling it over to my own IRA. But it is something that you want to be careful of uh, and make sure that you take care the right step based on your circumstances. Because once that IRA transfers, there's no going back. And that's one of the key reasons why we wanted to have this education workshop is because too often we have someone come into our office who says, I inherited this IRA at the bank and they cashed it out. What can I do with those funds now? And once the money comes out of the IRA, that's it. It's over. You can't roll it back over. You can't put it back in. Um, and so we want to make sure that you're aware of the circumstances before you take action. Now, the third option that's available for a spouse is that you can disclaim it. And the disclaimer process only works if there are contingent beneficiaries named on an IRA. So you have primary beneficiaries that would inherit the IRA. And then there are contingent beneficiaries if your primary beneficiary predeceases you or is unable uh, to take or doesn't want to take the funds from it, they can disclaim it and skip over them and pass it on to the contingent beneficiaries. So if I'm a, a spouse and I inherit a small IRA from my wife and it has charity as the contingent beneficiary or even our two daughters as the contingent beneficiary, I may choose to say, I don't want those funds or need those funds. So I'm just going to disclaim it and pass it on to the contingent beneficiaries. So that is an option. And then the fourth is that you can certainly take the full distribution. You can just catch it out, pay the tax on it potentially, um, if it's a traditional IRA and move on with that. So those are the four options that are available to a spouse. Now, another type of eligible designated beneficiary is a minor child. And I want to make sure that you know that when the tax code refers to minor children, they were referring to your specific children, not children in general. Um, that's your son, daughter, uh, and grandchildren don't count as your children. As much as you love those grandchildren, uh, they, for this case, they don't count as minor children. So this only applies to your direct relatives. Now, minor children, those under the age of majority, uh, which here in Connecticut and most states is the age 21, um, but there are some states that that is age 18. Uh, so, up until age 21, uh, a minor child is able to receive annual distributions from an inherited IRA based on their life expectancy. There's a, a single life expectancy table for the IRS. And so based on the age of the child, they would use that factor to calculate a, a minimum distribution that comes out to them each year. And then when they reach the age of majority, so in Connecticut, where we turn 21, then the 10-year rule kicks in. Basically, then an annual required minimum distribution would continue to come out in years one through nine, but the entire account would have to be paid out by the end of the 10th year after the birthday. So if my birthday is September 23rd, then when I turn 21, 10 years after that, uh, by December 31st of that year, I have to have that account completely paid out. So another example is uh, Lisa, who is age 10. She inherits her parents' IRA. Um, so she would receive annual distributions for 11 years until she reaches age 21. And then she starts the 10 year payout period. So minor children get a little bit extra time because they're not legally able to execute contracts or make decisions before the age of majority. Um, so they have that life expectancy option available to them until they reach that point. 
Now, the other three types of eligible designated beneficiaries are all treated the same way when it comes to inherited IRAs. So uh, disabled individuals, chronically ill, or individuals not more than 10 years younger. So this applies to potentially uh, spouse or partners that are not married, uh, but close in age. If you inherit an IRA, you may qualify for this treatment as an individual not more than 10 years younger, or if you're passing on your IRA to siblings, to a sister or brother um, that are close in age to you. With all of these other eligible designated beneficiaries, they have the opportunity to stretch out the distributions from the inherited IRA over their life expectancy. So this is the one circumstance where you can still have a stretch in addition to the spouse being able to stretch it out over their lifetime. So those are the types of eligible designated beneficiaries. So now we're gonna to turn towards everybody else. Um, so that's your son, daughter, niece, nephew, everybody, your neighbor, me, if you wanna add me as your beneficiary. Uh, <laughs> uh, by the way, my first name is Robert. I go by my middle name, Greg. So it's Robert Gregory Hammond, in case you want that for your beneficiary form. But non-eligible designated beneficiaries. And one another way to think about that is just what we call non-spouse beneficiaries. Um, so for non-spouse beneficiaries, they're subject to the 10-year rule, meaning that it all has to be paid out by December 31st of the 10th year following the year that the individual passed away and passed on that IRA. Now, the first decision, though, in deciding what to do according to the 10-year rule is to find out exactly when the IRA owner died. Uh, so what age did they die? Because there is an important date that we all need to be aware of in that we all have to be aware of what's called the required beginning date or the RBD. And I'm gonna to refer to this throughout the rest of our presentation because whether you pass away before the RBD or after the RBD, you're going, it will direct different ways that your IRA has to be treated. So I just take a, a quick break here before I go on to required beginning date, Alan. I see your question about inherited IRA distributions. When they come out, can they be added to your Roth IRA? Absolutely. So if you are a beneficiary and you're required to take money out of an inherited IRA, if you're eligible to make a Roth IRA contribution, you can turn right around and take that money and reinvest it in your own personal retirement account. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about some strategies on how to make the most use of your uh, IRA when you inherit one. So when we're talking about required beginning date, we want to take a look at the first year, which for right now under current code, you are required to start taking required minimum distributions from your retirement accounts at age 73. Now, for those of you that may be born after 1960, uh, in 2033, that age will go from 73 up to 75. Um, so in that case, you'll be thinking ahead at age 75. And that will be your first distribution there, that you'll be required to take out a minimum distribution. Now, when you reach that first year for your required minimum distribution, there's an add-on for just that one year only that you have potentially an additional three months of the following year to take out your first required minimum distribution. Uh, now, the challenge there is if you wait and you take out your required minimum distribution in those first three months, you'll be required to take out the second distribution for that second distribution that same year. But this is what equals the required beginning date. So for all of us, no matter your birth date, no matter the date that you die, your required beginning date will always be April 1st of your second distribution year. 
Um, so whether that's the year after you turn 73 or after you turn 75, or for those of you that have already reached that milestone, it may have been when you turn 72 or 70 and a half. Um, so this is the importance of the required beginning date. Now, one of the other things to remember is that a Roth IRA, because your money comes out of a Roth IRA completely income tax-free, there's no minimum required distribution. And because of that, there is no RBD. There's no required beginning date for a Roth IRA. So if all of your money is in a Roth IRA for retirement, you don't have an RBD, and so you don't have minimum distributions, and that won't factor into the equation. So when we take a look at those non-spouse beneficiaries then, whether it's a Roth IRA or you pass away before your required beginning date, what ends up happening is that there are no annual requirements, but the account is subject to that 10-year rule, and you're required to withdraw the amount out within 10 years. Now, in the case of a Roth IRA, it makes sense to just let it stay invested the full 10 years and then take it out at the end of year 10. Let it grow as much as possible in the Roth IRA because you'll get that tax deferred growth and it, come out, it comes out tax free. Now, on the other hand, if the owner of the IRA passes on or after that, there will be required minimum distributions in years one through nine. Um, so there will be a minimum amount that has to come out uh, after that required beginning date. And the full account balance, again, will have to be paid out before December 31st of the 10th year. Now keep in mind, this doesn't apply to Roth IRA. So even if you're past 73, 75 and you die, the Roth IRAs always are going to be treated as no annual payments and just have the 10-year rule. But traditional IRAs will have a 10-year rule with a required minimum distribution to be paid out during those years. So again, just to make sure that you know that it, no matter when you pass away during the year, it'll always be through the end of the year that the 10-year rule applies. So if an IRA owner died on March 31st of 2021, then that IRA must be fully liquidated or distributed before December 31st of 2031. And that's how the 10-year rule works. So what are some strategies you can use to pay less income taxes when you inherited IRA. Kind of what Alan was pointing to earlier, can I turn around and put it into my own investment account? Well, I wanna start off by making you aware of things that you cannot do with an inherited IRA, um, because we wanna make sure that you don't trigger one of these things. So unless you're a surviving spouse, you cannot roll it over into your own IRA. It has to stay separate as an inherited IRA. And that applies even if there's multiple beneficiaries. So if you and your siblings are the beneficiaries on your parents' IRA, uh, you'll each have your portion broken out as a separate inherited IRA, but it cannot be combined with your own IRA. Also, inherited IRA distributions cannot be rolled over within 60 days. Uh, you may not be aware, but with your own traditional IRA, if you take out a distribution, if I take $10,000 out and I just say, oh, I don't need that money, I can put it back into my IRA within 60 days and there'll be no tax consequences. It can also be used if you're moving an IRA from one place to another, you can take it out and put it back in within 60 days and have no tax consequences. I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. I prefer it going directly from one custodian to the other with a trustee to trustee transfer, but you do have that opportunity for a 60 day window of putting money back in, but that does not apply to inherited IRAs. Now you also cannot contribute to an inherited IRA. So once you have one, uh, you can't add money to it. 
money's only going one direction for inherited IRAs, and that's out the door. It's got to come out of the inherited IRA. You also cannot convert an inherited IRA to a Roth IRA. So, Alan, as you mentioned earlier, you can take money out of the inherited IRA and then make a contribution to your Roth IRA, but you can't convert it directly from the inherited IRA to a Roth IRA. And then lastly, you cannot combine required minimum distributions from inherited IRAs and your personal IRA. So if you are 75 and required to take out minimum distributions and you have both an inherited IRA from your mother, for example, and you have your own IRA, you can't take your minimum distribution all out of one or the other. You have to take out the required minimum distributions for both types independent of each other. So your personal IRAs, you can combine that you can take all out of one IRA to cover the minimum distribution for multiple IRAs, but for inherited IRAs, they have to be kept separate from your personal accounts. So then we talked about what we can't do. Here are some things that we can do. So, and these things that you should be aware of that you can move an inherited IRA to a new custodian. So if the IRA you inherited was held at Fidelity or Vanguard or somewhere else, you can move that account to another investment company. Uh, you're not required to keep it where it is that you inherited it, um, but it will require to be transferred into the inherited IRA at that company before you can move it to a new custodian. Now, also, when it comes to the inherited IRA, you can control the timing of your distributions, except for those minimum distributions if the person passes away after the required beginning date and you're a non-spouse beneficiary, you have complete control on how much to withdraw during that 10-year time frame. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, on a next, in a future slide here. So the distributions, which could be subject to income taxes when they come out, uh, again, are not subject to early withdrawal penalties because it's an inherited IRA, but you control when to recognize that income. The third is that you can combine inherited IRAs from the same person. So if your father has an IRA at Fidelity and an IRA at Charles Schwab, you can combine those together as long as they're both from the same person. But if you inherited an IRA from your father and you inherited an IRA from your mother, those cannot be combined because they're from two different people. But those that are inherited from the same person's person can be combined. Now, the fourth is you can make qualified charitable distributions. To just touch on that briefly, and I recommend if you'd like to learn more about that, uh, take a look at our Power Hour that talks about tax saving strategies to do before year end, is qualified charitable distributions. If you're over the age of 70 and a half, you can gift money directly from an IRA to a charity. It counts towards your minimum distribution and it comes out income tax free, which can save you both on federal taxes as well as potentially on state taxes. Um, so it's a great way to use inherited funds or even your own IRA to make a charitable impact without income taxes. So you can use inherited IRAs to make qualified charitable distributions. And the last one is you can name new beneficiaries on your inherited IRA. So it's very important when you inherit an IRA and you set up your own inherited IRA, make sure that you're putting on your beneficiaries of who you want that account to go to in the event that something happens to you before it's fully distributed. Uh, you want to make sure that you have your own beneficiaries named on your inherited IRA. So I was talking about that you have complete control over when to recognize the income. And that's why it's important to talk to a financial coach when you inherit an IRA to talk through what the future looks like. You want to take a look at what your current income is compared to your future income 
on when is it most appropriate for you to try to recognize that income and maintain at the lowest tax rate possible. If you're currently in a position where you're earning a high income and you're in one of the higher tax brackets, you may only want to take nothing or the minimum distribution out of an inherited IRA until you retire or your income goes down. Or if uh, you are in a situation where your income is lower, whether that's because you're in between jobs or in some circumstances, I've worked with clients where a spouse is going back to school or temporarily not working so that there is lower income, you may want to take out more of the inherited IRA in those low income years and less in the future. So it's important to think about what does the next 10 years look like for you when you inherit an IRA and then allocate that income coming out to make sure that you're trying to minimize the income tax consequences of taking it out. Because your IRA, it will be taxable to you or your beneficiary at some point. Um, So we wanna make sure that Uncle Sam gets as little as possible for that and that more goes to you, your family, or the causes and organizations you care about. So another way of decreasing that income when you're getting more income from the inherited IRA is to look at increasing your deductions to offset that increased income. So one strategy is if you're still working and you're employed at a place that has an employer retirement plan, you may want to increase your contribution to the retirement plan to offset the money that you're required to take out or need to take out of the inherited IRA. So for example, if I have a $100,000 IRA that I received from my father, so if I spread it out over the 10 years, it's roughly around $10,000 per year that I'm gonna take out of that account. It'll be more hopefully because the account will grow over that time. I can increase my contribution to my 401k by $10,000 so that when I receive that income out of the inherited IRA, I've reduced my income coming from my employer. So my income take home is the same, but my tax liability remains the same as well. Um, So that is a, a great way to help offset any increase in income. Another way that you can do that is to bunch your charitable deductions. Again, in our workshop where we talk about tax saving strategies, one of the things that we talk about is bunching charitable deductions that can use a vehicle or strategy using a donor advised fund where you can make a larger amount of donations in a single year to get a better tax deduction in that year and then in subsequent years use the standard deduction. Um, So if you have an amount that you're required to take out of an inherited IRA, you could turn around and make a charitable donation to a donor advised fund or directly to charities to offset that income. And then also one of the ways of saving for retirement that I think many people don't Uh, realize or take advantage of is making sure that you contribute the maximum amount to your health savings account. Uh, Most individuals these days with their health insurance have a high deductible plan, which is combined with a health savings account. Uh, Your health savings account, you can contribute into it and it carries forward year after year, unlike a medical savings account, which is to be depleted each year by the end of the year, a health savings account can carry forward to you and you can contribute to it up until age 65 when you qualify for Medicare. Um, So if you're under 65, this can be a great way of putting money away for those health expenses in retirement. Uh, If you are in a position of where your health savings account can be invested, it can also be a way of growing that account over time as well. So we've talked a little bit about what do you do when you inherit the IRA. 
Now we want to turn to the other side of that coin and talking about what are some strategies to use for passing on more wealth to your beneficiaries. Because as I mentioned, all of your traditional IRA is going to be taxable to you or your beneficiaries at some point. The last thing that you want to do is create an IRA situation where your children or whoever you name as your beneficiaries inherits the IRA when they hit their peak earning years. So now they're at the peak of their career, they're earning the most that they probably will in their lifetime, and now they're required to take money out of your IRA on top of that, and it triggers more taxes. The reason why that's important is that then they're paying a higher percentage tax rate. So if you could choose to pass on 100% or a good portion of your IRA to your beneficiaries, or are you gonna lose half of it in income taxes? I think all of us would agree that we'd like to leave more than less. So here are four strategies to think about as we talk about passing on more wealth. You may want to consider paying the taxes now, converting part or all of your IRA to a Roth IRA. As I mentioned, a Roth IRA has no required beginning date, so there's no minimum distribution for you, and it can grow, and when it's inherited, it comes out tax-free and can be left in there for the full 10 years before being required to pull out. Also, at a time that we're looking at a higher national debt and uh, the possibility of Social Security running out of money, there will be higher taxes in our future. So does it make sense to pay tax on those retirement savings now? And you can convert part. It doesn't require you to convert all of it. So you can dial in the amount that you want to uh, convert. Uh, If you'd like to see an example of that, I encourage you to go to our recording on our YouTube channel of our year-end tax saving strategies. We go over a specific example about a Roth IRA conversion that you may find helpful. The second strategy is if you're over age 70 and a half, instead of writing a check to your local charity, use your IRA to make your qualified charitable distributions. Keep the cash in your checking account. Instead, fill out a distribution form and pay that donation directly from your IRA to charity. You can donate up to $100,000 per year uh, from your IRA to charity. And if you are over age 73 or over uh, 72, if you just recently uh, became required to take out minimum distributions, Uh, you also can count those distributions towards your minimum distribution each year. So that's a great way to use those pre-tax dollars without any tax consequences. Now, the third strategy is leave your non-retirement assets to family and leave your taxable assets to charity. There's a, a strategy that we call double your retirement, where you name charity as the beneficiary of your IRA and then use part or some of your required minimum distribution to buy life insurance on the other side of that to create tax-free assets to your family. So when you're thinking about your overall net worth, you shouldn't just be thinking, well, I'm going to just carve it up. You know, I want to leave 80% to my children and 20% to charity and just divide it up across the board. Now, we should be thinking strategically on the fact that the taxable assets from our retirement accounts should be the ones that target towards charity, and the non-retirement accounts that you've already paid tax on should be left to your family members. And the fourth is using life insurance. I briefly mentioned about using it to replace a retirement account. If you leave it to charity, you can replace it with life insurance, but you can also use life insurance to cover the income taxes. If you have a million dollar IRA and you know that your children are gonna have to pay a large amount of taxes on that IRA when it comes out to them, you may choose to have a life insurance policy that comes back into the picture and pays an amount to the kids to help cover that tax liability. 
So that can be either as an individual life or if you're a married couple, you can look at what's called a second to die life insurance policy. Um, so that benefit doesn't pay until the death of the second spouse. But there are opportunities to plan on using life insurance to either cover income taxes or replace an IRA that you want to leave to charity. So those are four strategies on ways that you can pass on more wealth from your IRA to your beneficiaries. And if you have any questions about those, I encourage you to schedule a time to meet with a financial coach at Hammond Isles Wealth Advisors and be happy to, to go over those in more detail for you. Uh, we are here to create a clear path for you, knowing that having a knowledge about what you're invested in and why allows you to have peace of mind and live more purposefully. So here are some ways that we can help if you're new to Hammond Isles Wealth Advisors. Uh, we offer these online financial power hours, which if you want to go back and rewatch this or any of our previous power hours, you'll find them all on our YouTube channel, uh, as well as our weekly uh, financial tip that comes out on every Friday. Those will all be found on our YouTube channel, uh, as well as on our social media. So I encourage you to follow, connect, or like us on the social media platform of your choice um, that you'll find us there. Uh, also on our website, you'll find a large amount of resources that are available for free download for you. Uh, one of our more popular downloads is a family inventory worksheet that allows you to consolidate all of your financial information and plans into a single document that you can keep with your legal documents or pass on to your beneficiaries so they know where everything is and what you want to happen with your investments. Uh, also, uh, one of the other popular ones is 20 things to do when your loved one passes away. It's a checklist of things that you need to take care of and something that you may not uh, realize. As always, we're available for a free count conversation with a financial coach. If you go to our website at hiwealth.com, there's a real easy button in the upper right-hand corner that you can click on and schedule a quick conversation at your convenience. So at this point, as I mentioned, all questions are welcome. I'd like to stop here and take questions from you. And if we have not answered your question during this workshop, I encourage you to email it to hello at hiwealth.com and we'll make sure that we respond to you. So with that, I, I thank you for joining us 